Welcome to The Plant Report, a radio show that educates about the green world one plant at a time. The Plant Report is a new educational resource about plants, herbal medicine, ethnobotany, and the human-plant relationship. Listen to our podcast, read our blog, watch our videos, and learn from experts and the plants. The Plant Report is a project of Sustainable World Radio and is hosted by Jill Cloutier. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report because every plant has a story. My guest today is Byron Joel, and Byron is going to be talking about another useful permaculture plant, and this one is the bunya pine, or bunya bunya, and I'll let Byron fill you fill us in on the many names of this very beautiful and useful plant. So welcome to The Plant Report, Byron. Thanks for having me, Jill. Yeah, um, this plant has heaps of um, common names in, in a number of languages, so the uh, Latin name is Aracoria bidwillii, and the uh, the common names are Bunya Bunya, Buni 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 Bonya, and pretty and about two dozen variations of that kind of sound. Could, there were many different dialects, Aboriginal dialects, up and down the east coast of Western Australia. The plant itself, Aracoria. Bidwillii. It belongs to the Oricoraceae family, uh, which is a coniferous family. They're not a pine, despite most of them in their English common names being called pine, like the monkey puzzle pine is a close relative. The bunya pine is another name for it. They're not pines. They're their own distinct family and genus within the greater conifer family. Where um, naturally is this tree found? Well, once upon a time, it and its relatives covered the whole planet. Like this is a proper dinosaur tree. They are very, very old, early form of coniferous plant. Um, and then during the Cretaceous, they seem to die out entirely in the Northern Hemisphere. And they're now dotted around. This is the greater family at large I'm talking about. They're dotted around the Southern Hemisphere, um, the kind of Gondwana continents, um, South America has its versions. In fact, Oricaria, the family and genus name, is named for a Chilean tribe. Is it Chilean? No, Peruvian tribe, um, where that you know were, were associated strongly with the monkey puzzle tree, the Oricaria uh, tribe. But now the bunya itself is isolated to. There's a little pocket of it in far northern Queensland, west uh, eastern Australia then southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. Could you give us an idea of some of the other members of this um, Aracaria family? Yeah, sure. Well, like I said, the monkey puzzle of um, South America, and it's very similar. Uh, That has far smaller cones than the bunya and smaller nuts, but very similar, very similar uses. Then there's the kauri or kari trees of New Zealand, which are immense. They're huge as well. They're a sacred tree to the Māori. There's the hoop pine in eastern Australia and a number of others. Oh, there's the Norfolk Island pine, which is fairly well known in Australia. It's this immense, it's like a Christmas tree on steroids. <laughs> like it's like it's like a 50, 60 metre tall uh, tree. That's uh, Oricaria heterophylla. Then there's the Woolamai pine, which is actually really interesting. Anyone who finds these kind of like living fossil trees interesting, go and Google the Woolamai pine. So these trees, you're talking about the trees in this family. To me, they seem like all of, or I would assume all or most of them had a long relationship with people and they're just giant, strong trees. Yeah. Um, one thing that the bunya bunya is known for are the humongous cones. Can you tell our listeners about those? Yeah, they're immense. Um, they're just you, you, people when they see them for the first time just laugh because imagine imagine a pine cone, a regular pine cone, but you know bigger than a, a human head, like bigger than a couple of bowling balls put together. They're immense, and uh, they. They grow on the trees. They ripen in late summer, usually here. Um, they are there are smaller crops, but every kind of two or th- three seasons, there is a huge bumper crop of them, and each of them contain, you know, anywhere from one to two, three dozen 
of these cones, uh, sorry, nuts within them that are the size of like a, a imagine a, a, a golf ball, but a, a kind of teardrop shaped golf ball size. And inside of those is like a really starchy carbohydrate uh, kernel. And these are edible. Yeah, my word, yeah. Yeah, so tell us about these and um, how you would eat them. Can you eat them raw? Do you have to cook them? Um, yes, you can eat them raw, but they're kind of like eating a raw chestnut. Um, in fact, they're very similar in constitution. Like it's a very, it's a starch rich nut. It's starch. There's there's very little oil in this nut, like there would be in say a macadamia or a cashew, which are very oil rich. This is very starchy, like a chestnut. So you can eat them raw, but they're a bit, um, you know, they're a bit kind of hard to chew on. Usually, the traditional way is either baking them, or ideally boiling them, because by boiling them they don't dry out quite as much. The Aborigines used to do a number of things. So they would they would put them in like the coals of the fire, but they would also, in some cases, and this 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 ties into their unusual germination habit. So I'll, I'll t- step back for a moment. You imagine you take one of these seeds and you plant it. It's when it sprouts, it doesn't go straight up. It goes down. It sends out a little stem, and it goes down usually until it hits a harder surface, but the exact reason as to why it then forms a tuba is unknown. So it does that. It forms this tuba, and then from that tuba, it sprouts and comes back up. Now, that that tuba was considered um, a delicacy as well. So quite often the Aboriginal peoples would take a whole bunch of them, pack them in clay, and bury them somewhere cool and moist and wait until that they had sprouted and come back later and eat that tuba. Now, as to the nutritional, the difference in the nutritional value and calorific value and all that, I'm not sure. It's actually quite difficult to find nutritional values for them. The only place I could find it was Wikipedia, for instance. No one else seemed to have anything. The early settlers who noticed these these things and did you know recognize their similarity similarity to chestnuts, they their their preferred way of cooking them was to boil them in the brine of their like corned beef or silver side. So any kind of salty, savory brine, because it would it wouldn't dry the nut out like cook uh, baking it would, and it would give it a slightly savory, salty flavor. I could, can I read a quote for you? Yeah, sure, that would be great. Okay, this is from a guy called Jay Maiden in uh, Forest Flora of New South Wales from 1889. The cones shed their seeds, which are sweet before being perfectly ripe, and after that resemble roasted chestnuts in taste. They are plentiful once in three years, and when the ripening season arrives, the Aborigines assemble in large numbers from a great distance around and feast upon them. Each tribe has its own particular set of trees, and of these each family has a certain number allotted, which are handed down from generation to generation with great exactness. The food seems to have a fattening effect on the Aborigines, and they eat large quantities of it before roasting it at the fire. Contrary to their usual habits, they sometimes store up the bunion nuts, hiding them in water. In, uh, in a water hole for a month or two. So it, it was a major cultural event, this, this bumper crop. So every three years they have this huge crop and it's actually quite dangerous to walk under them because they, they kill people. You know, if they fall on your head, you, you know, they'll do serious damage. Now, can these nuts, um, can they be ground up, I wonder, for flour or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Like there, there's... They're a really good gluten-free meal. They, they are ground up. There's all sorts of stuff on the internet, kind of pretty low-key and all from kind of East Coast, West Australians who have their own little variation in, in how they prepare them. But, uh, yeah, I, I've had them myself in the form of flour. It's very doable. you just got to dry them out properly. Like chestnut. You treat it exactly like a chestnut, really. And so the Aborigines had a very close relationship with the trees. So each tribe would have a set of trees. Does it take, would they take care of these trees or is the tree pretty maintenance free? They, once you, once a bunyapine is established, they don't need any maintenance. Um, Yeah. So the Aborigines would come down from near and far in their thousands to the areas where these trees were um, fruiting en masse every three years and have these major clan gatherings where they would settle disputes, arrange marriages, just discuss this and that. And uh, in during that time, it was often 
um, you'd have the initiation ceremonies for young men and they'd have to climb the bunya pines to um, retrieve the uh, cones, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you go up to one of these things and, and touch their leaves. They're like, they're super hard and super sharp. They cut you up. They're almost like little scalpels. By the time these young Aboriginal men came down from the, the trees, they looked like they'd been in a fight with a wildcat. But what I was going to say, I forgot, was when these young men climbed the trees to collect the pine cones, um, they would often time it so it was just before they were ripe. They, would they wouldn't necessarily wait till the uh, pine cones were falling, which that would make it easier to harvest. But if they went up early enough, they could, they could pick the nuts, the, the cones, before the sugars had turned to starch. So you, they get a much sweeter, richer meal from it. And that was the, that was the prime optimum way for them to, to eat it. How interesting. And these trees, how tall are these trees? Uh, I think 45 metres is the tallest recorded, I believe, and anywhere in between. That's about, I think, what, like 145 feet? That is incredible. So this is a, just a massive, powerful plant. Very, very. Massive, powerful plant that has a long history with people. Yes. Coexisting it's, with people. It's almost, it reminds me of the, of the way oak was viewed and perceived in the Northern Hemisphere, especially where, like the Western European kind of traditional attributes that oak is given, you know, like that robust strength and that kind of immovability and, and providence in the way the acorns would fall. It's, it's a similar kind of totemic vibe, mm -hmm. I find. And, and the spiritual connection people feel with those trees as well. Yeah, very much. Now, if someone's listening and they're thinking, you know, I really would love to grow one of these trees, mm. how much do you need a large property, number one? And two, um, do these trees, how, how long lived are they? And do they use a lot of water? Or could you give us a few about their needs growing? Yeah, I would seriously advise against anyone putting them in an urban lot. Especially next to your house? Especially anywhere like anywhere that you want to be walking or growing anything else or they're, 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 they're evergreen for a start. They're very prickly. They drop potentially lethal cannonballs every three years at least. They're just, I mean, if you really, really want one, go for it, but check with your neighbours. I'm not sure if they have terribly invasive root systems or anything, but they're really, they're, they're made for a broad, a broader scale kind of system. Right, with a yeah. lot of land. And are they long-lived? Yeah, they're very long-lived, uh, you know, hundreds of years at least. I'm, I couldn't tell you exactly how long they think the old, oldest ones are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen these in Southern California. Yeah, they got around. Like um, the, the, these early botanists who discovered them um, in Australia took them around the world. They're, it's remarkable to spread. I've actually written it down. Um, they're in... They're like California, Mexico, uh, all through the Mediterranean, Ireland, um, all over the place, Cairo and Egypt. They, they fruit from as far south as I've seen as Hobart and Tasmania, which is 42.8 degrees latitude south, um, which is, you know, it's not snowing or anything, but it's pretty damn cold compared to where they're from. And I've seen them growing very happily and fruiting in desert conditions and very happy in fruiting in subtropical and full tropical. So that's a, a major spread. Like I, I don't know how far you'd be able to push them polewood into the cold, um, but everywhere else they seem to be do fine. As long as they, you get them established, they, they, they're happy and they fruit well. So anything else, Byron, that you would want to share with our listeners about this amazing tree? Um. I just, if anyone's thinking about perennial staple crop systems, of which I'm kind of really excited about, this is the kind of plant that you you seriously want to consider. I mean, again, it's the it's the kind of thing that you know you your generation may not reap the benefits from um, because they take 15 to 20 years to even start fruiting. But imagine. In, in permaculture talk, a zone four, five edge system somewhere off at the edge of, of you know, the, the farm or the village or what have you, where 
you know, once they're established, you don't need to do anything more to them. They're hyper robust. You just leave them to their own devices. And every year you just take a walk or, or whatever to, to these, this grove and collect with your- With a hard hat on. Yeah, with a helmet and a shield and, uh, and collect your, your pine cones for major, major you know, perennial staple crop production with minimum effort. Once you establish these trees, once they're kind of you know happy enough to survive on rainfall alone, that's all you have to do. And yeah, you got to wait a while, but the the reward is reward is you know broad scale uh, staple crop production, which is you know what we rely on the most for our food. So I just think they're extremely valuable, especially in terms of staple crop production. And plus, you get all the benefits that trees give us you know, added yeah. with that food source, which is so valuable. Yeah. And another, another little, one little tip I'll leave um, potentially entrepreneuring permaculturalists with is uh, mate, uh, uh, yerba mate, the uh, South American caffeine um, holding um, herbal drink. They, that plant, the mate bush, its natural environment is growing as an understory in uh, oricoria forests. So I mean, there's there's a little polyculture polycultural system just waiting to be trialed as well. So someone might want to give that a crack. Well, thank you so much for your time today and sharing with us the many benefits of this amazing bunya bunya tree. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to the Plant Report. The Plant Report is produced by Jill Cloutier and is a project of Sustainable World Radio. For more podcasts about plants, permaculture, and ecology, visit our website, sustainableworldradio.com, and you can also find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. The Plant Report is created for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to thank the plants for everything they do.